And thank you very much for coming on the show, man. It is an absolute pleasure to have you on board. It's wicked that you could be here today, man. I thank you so much for having me on, man. It's a true honor. No, no, it's it's so, so, so sick. And I, I am really excited about this because I think, again, as someone that is a specialist in your field, you are going to bring so many different points of reference to the conversation, which I find really interesting. And I think that like a lot of people will find it interesting at home as well. Obviously, you work with such a plethora of different people from different sporting backgrounds that the diverse range of athletes means that you as a practitioner, you know, you have to have such a varying range of tools in your toolbox to be able to treat any of these guys. But I'm interested to know from the get go, because you're a technician, man, like you break everything down, like you take everything through with a fine tooth comb. And I fucking love it. It's brilliant. I really, really like to see it. But I'm interested to know, like, when did you kind of catch that bug? When were you like, oh man, like the biomechanics of the body like really interests me, like this movement pattern, like, oh, I can see that this is breaking down here. Why don't we try this? Like, when did you get on board with all of this stuff? <laughs> yeah, I mean, so I went to undergraduate uh, degree college at uh, Truman State University, got my exercise science degree. And in doing so, I remember taking a biomechanics class and just being introduced to the idea of evaluating, analyzing, um, and basically just digging into the science of movement. I really, really enjoyed that class. And I think really being a weightlifter for as long as I have, I started competing in Olympic weightlifting in 2005, so over a decade of time under the bar. And I think the big thing that a lot of people realize about Olympic weightlifting is that it is extremely technique oriented. Not that powerlifting or strongman isn't, but to a point you can muscle through a tough squat you can yeah. muscle through a tough bench but it's you can't muscle through a tough snap you know it's <laughs> it's uh just wave goodbye to those shoulders now yeah, man <laughs> that exact, it's that exact combination of skill precision uh strength and power as well that really allowed me to fall in love with weightlifting so when i decided to take my career down the physical therapy route and to really help athletes recover from injury I sort of blended all those ideas with my current passions at the time, which was uh, working out and training and competing and weightlifting and then also enjoying uh, exercise science. I mean, I would sit in the back of a lot of my physical therapy school classes reading the Journal of Strength and Conditioning Research. So like that was always my mindset going into it was that I wanted to really pair my passions of weight training biomechanics, understanding how an athlete moves and how we can manipulate things to not only get out of injury, but also for their performance and to sort of blend those with my then, you know, new passion of uh, learning the physical therapy world and then getting into that. Yeah, it's really interesting that you talk about that, like in terms of like learning how to move. And I think that's really, yep. really important from a practitioner standpoint. So I do uh, sports massage therapy. I've always been massively interested in all this sort of stuff. So uh, mm -hmm. like I, I'm very lucky that I work uh, in a physiotherapy clinic with, you know, we've got um, Paul Forley, who is the ex uh, England rugby first team physiotherapist, you know, worked with a bunch of bunch of guys and I take as much information off of him as I possibly can. But I, I'm really interested to kind of get into it in terms of understanding the fundamental mechanics of movement as a lifter, then coming across as a practitioner i feel like that then actually opens up such a huge scope of practice with your clients that isn't just kind of these uh and you know i'm not going to sit here and shit on the practice but kind of like the resistance band basic you know go off do do just this basic rehabilitation stuff rather than oh, okay actually like yeah your, your hips are shit because you're moving like shit let's get you under mm -hmm. a bar and see what we can do here because you yeah. don't have that knowledge. I think that's really, really fascinating. Do you feel like that's had a, a big impact? And how do you think that more physical practitioners should be looking to do that sort of stuff? I think it's had a huge impact on the way I treat. Sort of the, the main story that I like to tell a lot of people as far as how did Squat University even evolve? I was having these deja vu-like days where I would have an evaluation of an athlete. Now I'm talking could have been knee pain, hip pain, back pain, ankle pain, something where it wasn't a surgery, where I knew there was a direct surgical intervention that, that brought them to me as a physiotherapist. Now, during that time, during that evaluation, it was then my goal to figure out why did that person develop an injury, sort of play detective, if you will. And during that time, I would have them always get out of their shoes and show me a couple different movements. And first off, I would say, let me see a squat. And not only let me see you squat, but let me see you squat to full depth without any shoes on and your toes relatively straightforward. 
And then also show me a single leg squat. And I have seen some of the biggest, strongest athletes in the entire world. I've worked with guys that have squatted well over a thousand pounds, multiple guys that have squatted over a thousand pounds. I've worked with, you know, NFL athletes that can run, you know, a four, four 40, you know, I, I'm seeing the biggest, strongest and fastest in the world. And time and time again, I'm seeing this connection, this deja vu like scenario where I'm seeing these athletes with pain. And they also have this one common connection that they cannot perform a basic body weight squat or single leg squat with good quality. There's something that's broken in that pattern. And of all the different movement patterns that we have available to us as humans, I find that the squat is sort of that fundamental building block that often falls apart and leads us to not only injury, but also detriments in performance as well. But it often goes unnoticed because we often think of the squat as an exercise first. Just like the bench, I mean, people are like, how much do you bench? People say, how much do you squat? People don't care necessarily how well they're moving or <laughs> if they have the ability to perform a great looking double leg squat. Can they sit in the bottom of an air squat with great looking technique? What does that look like? We don't care necessarily what the quality is as long as the quantity is up there, if that makes sense. Yeah, it's, so it's that typical I think, gym, gym bro flex, isn't it? It's like, yeah. Exactly. So we've, we've conceptually rearranged our athletic priorities to think that it's more important to squat that big weight. And it's okay if my knees wobble in a little. It's okay if my back runs a little bit because I got a new PR. I hit that 600 pounds. I've put 50 pounds on my PR in the last three months. And we take this such of a, a narrow-minded uh, view of our training life, of our movement life, and we don't think long term. And any strength athlete that's been around a number of old lifters, what do they always say? They're like, oh, I wish if I only knew what I knew now. You know, if I trained how I do now, back then, I may not be in so much pain or broken as I am now. And it's because we have taken this approach, like I said, we've conceptually rearranged our athletic priorities to think that it's more important to move big weight rather than how well we move. And I have experienced this not only in my dealings with athletes that are injured, but also in my own training career. I mean, there's many times where I've come up injured. I've pushed through lift after lift and had a little bit of a, a knee wobble or a rounded back. And here's the deal. I'm not saying that problems in lifts don't arise. I'm not saying that breakdowns in movement don't occur. They occur to everyone, even the best. But if you let it happen once, okay, you get you lost concentration, you're back rounded a little bit on this deadlift. Awesome. It happens to every single person. Realize that it happened and make the corrections because if you do it a second rep, if you allow it to occur a second time, now you're just building bad habits. And the thing that we look at when it comes to strength athletes is that injuries don't occur like that. We don't have these traumatic injuries often. I don't say they will never happen, but they're very low risk. Like a traumatic injury, such as a torn ACL. You're not going to see often a torn ACL in a weightlifting meet. But what you will have are these slow building injuries that's, you know, occur. Every single athlete, you know, my elbow's been a little achy. Now the inside of my knee, it nags me every once in a while. My back, you know, it's just, ah, it's not yeah, feeling very well. Yeah. Sometimes, you, you know, Every single athlete's had them. I've had them many times. I've had. Oh, yeah, dude, I, so I tore my PCL you know? and ruptured my yeah. ACL. Like, oh, you're yeah. preaching to the choir here, brother. I know what you mean. Everyone has <laughs> them. But the thing is, is that I think we can point to a lot of those issues as chronic building in nature because of poor movement. Yeah. Injuries occur because of two things. We either have inappropriate loads or we have problems in technique or movement. But a lot of lifters aren't going to have that approach and say, you know what? My technique's not as good as it is as it should be. Yeah. A lot of people aren't going to, to be that humble to say that. Yeah, it's all so, ego. you know, yeah. I mean, so, so as, as a practitioner, my idea behind how I treat patients is to first empathize with them and say, Hey man, I know what it feels like. I know how angry it feels inside when you can't be on that, that plan. You're, you're eight weeks through your current Russian squat program and your knee starts to hurt and you, you got to finish it. You got, you know, you had your mindset that you were going to hit a 20 pound PR in two weeks. You know, um, I know what it feels like to have your elbow hurt so bad that it makes snatching almost impossible three weeks out from a weightlifting meet, you know? So I understand those frustrations, but I'm also here to say, I also know what the other side looks like and why that developed. We're going to figure it out and how we're going to get back to doing that pain-free. I'm here to help. So really understanding and taking the, 
the experience in weightlifting, mixing it with my love of, of biomechanics, of exercise science, of weight training, and really bringing that together is how I've crafted everything that I do with weight training. And then to try to just give it away for free as much as possible has really been my mission with Squat University. And yeah. I don't even know if that answered your question, but. <laughs> no, I did. I, and I was absolutely brilliant. I was absolutely brilliant. I, I, uh, I think it's, it's really, really interesting, you know, when we look at the, the educational front and again, you kind of tapped on it then and I, and I'm kind of big at this talking about kind of longevity and it's something like, I mean, anyone that follows me on Instagram or, or, you know, is coached by me, they must be fucking sick of hearing it by now. But it's just, it's, it's so, so, so true. And I think it comes back around again. It's, it's the whole concept of you've, you've been run through the mill. You've been injured. You know what it's fucking like to be sat there staring down the barrel being like, okay, man, I know I've got like two weeks out. I know that this niggle is going to seriously hinder me. What am I going to do? You can empathize with those patients. And I think it's, again, it's interesting because it brings uh, another dynamic to your treatment is that you can put yourself in the athlete's shoes and again i don't think a lot of people can necessarily do that not necessarily people don't necessarily understand that mindset and once you've been a competitive mm -hmm. athlete and i think once you know you've competed at the level that like yourself has you have that competitive edge you have that hunger you really really want it badly and you're going to do anything for it so mm -hmm. again that then being in that mindset of Okay, I know this person's probably going to be going for this PR, even though, you know, we're, we've probably only got like 75% functionality of the supportive structure of their shoulder or whatever. It's like, okay, well, I can't fucking stop it. So I've just got to do whatever I can in the meantime to make sure that they get through the meet. So like, I yeah. think that must be really interesting how that's probably developed your like interactions with clients. Yeah, and you know, that's sort of the idea behind... There are the perfect situation in rehabilitation and then the realistic situation. Now, there's times where I'll get athletes that, you know, aren't anywhere near a weightlifting meet, aren't anywhere near a powerlifting competition. And I can realistically say, hey, because this is so bad, we need to take you out of your current training program. Your current training program is going to be rehab for these next couple weeks. <laughs> there's also realistic times where I get someone and it's like, hey, we've got a junior world weightlifting championship here in eight weeks. What are we going to do? And that's where there's a lot of collaboration between me, the athlete, and the coach to be like, hey, this is how we're going to structure our training and our programming right now with rehab so that we can train what we can train, but fix what we can fix. And that's also, I think, I'm able to bring a little bit of that insight that many other practitioners that have never spent time under the bar can have as far as being like, hey, let's talk about snatches today. I want to do powers. Uh, let's keep it maybe doubles and triples, max 70%, um, and let's go from the high hang, you know, for right now, for these first two weeks, and then we'll slowly bring down. That sort of foreign language, you're speaking French to someone that doesn't speak any French. You know, <laughs> I'm like, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm like, yeah, most people aren't going to understand that. <laughs> exactly. But, I mean, basically, the idea is that you need to speak the language of the athlete that you're talking to. And I think one of the biggest frustrations, speaking to a lot of strength athletes over the years, is that they talk to practitioners that have no idea about the demands that they're trying to put their body through. So, for example, you get an athlete who has back pain. And what do they do? First off, they rarely tell anyone about it. They just think <laughs> it's part of the game, right? They're like, oh, my back hurts. Yeah. I'm just going to pop this out. And open. That's part of being a power lifter, right? My yeah. back pain sometimes, right? So the second thing they'll do is that maybe – they will eventually go see a doctor. Now, by the time this occurs in their brain that they need to go see a doctor, their performance has probably already suffered. They've gotten to the point where they're so frustrated. It's not that it's pain that's driving them to go see the doctor, but it's that they can't do what they want to do. They can't do what they love to do. So that eventually drives them to say, I got to figure out what I need to do so I can get back to doing what I want to do. So they go to a doctor. Most doctors, Many physicians will say, there are many good ones, but many physicians for the most part will say, A, you need to stop lifting. Lifting heavy, that's what caused your pain. Take this medication, stop for two weeks, come back, see me. If it's not better, we'll get some MRIs or x-rays. We'll see what's physically going on. If it's still hurting then, all right, well, we have different options. We have injections. Oh, you know, yeah. we, could maybe, we could maybe think about eventual uh, surgery. I can refer you on to a surgeon. I've got some great spine surgeons kind of thing. When in reality, what we need to do is say, how do I find a practitioner that understands how to, under how to look at the root cause of what happened? 
not try to treat the symptoms, not try to treat the pain, but treat the root cause of what started this all in the first place. And a lot of times that can be, we can continue training, train what we can train, what we fix, what we can fix, but you have to find the right person that can understand that. And a number of physical therapists or physiotherapists around the world are taking this approach of understanding how to look at the body through a movement first perspective and to really diagnose injuries, not based on what we would call a pathoanatomical model. So I'm not going to um, be retraining someone or figuring them out based on like a small rotator cuff strain, yeah. but I'm figuring out how they're uh, maybe having a movement imbalance or a muscular imbalance or a, uh, in, uh, a flexibility issue that's leading to the impingement that then led to the rotator cuff strain. So we're, we're getting to the movement dysfunction that created the injury in the first place. Yeah, it's, it's like what you said about earlier. It's very much a game of problem solving. And I'd say this again, you know, as, as a massage therapist, I get people come in, it's like, okay, I have this pain here and I've had this and, you know, I've seen all these different people and it's like, okay, well, let's actually look at like the fundamentals. Like, let's have a look at how you're standing, how are you moving? And it's like, okay, well, actually when you're moving, you know, you've got a little bit more knee valgus on this left-hand side, your arch is collapsing in, that's then offsetting your hip mm -hmm. and then we're resulting long-term with, with spine pain. And it's like, okay, well, why has no one fucking said anything about this before? Like, if, 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 you're, <laughs> yeah. if you're moving like this, then your body is obviously going to have some, some level of dysfunction. And, mm -hmm. and that brings me perfectly onto the point I've spoken previously. I don't know if you know Andrew Locke from Australia, big physiotherapist, mm -hmm. kind of talking about the idea of tightness versus weakness and kind of what you're saying there is that, mm -hmm. you know, we love this term like imbalances, um, and especially in trained population, you know, people that are, you know, maybe just training three particular lifts for a particular sport, let's say, they <laughs> might have a very isolated selection of exercises, which then increases mm -hmm. only a very specific set of muscles, which creates very <laughs> large imbalances, which obviously exactly. then impacts their overall performance. So I really want you to yeah. touch on this. How much of this do you think is true? How much of, of the the dysfunctions that we're seeing could easily be kind of fixed with working on something, you know, tightness in the ankle, tightness in the calf. Okay. Well, maybe your tib anterior is just weak as shit. And actually we just need to strengthen that up, you know, things like this that people aren't necessarily looking at. What do you think? Yeah, that's a great question. I think what it all comes down to is understanding movement has to be our first line of defense. And we're looking at movement first. And when you see an imbalance or a problem, then we dive deeper. So I really like to use, for example, when I'm teaching this, the joint by joint approach that Greg Cook and Mike Boyle, what they sort of talked about in their book, Movement, was one of the first places it was talked about. And it's the idea that the body is ever connected. Some people call it interdependency. Basically, there's different levels of the body and how they all correlate and work together to create this purposeful uh, harmonious movement. If you want to think about it another way, um, if you were to look at a symphony orchestra, it's composed of a number of different types of musicians all playing different instruments, right? We have a tuba, we have a violinist, we have a, a pianist, but while they're all playing different instruments, they all have to play together at the same time for this perfect harmony sound. If not, if you got the trumpets off playing their own thing, <laughs> that sound is horrible, right? Well, in the same sense, if we look at our body that way, there's different parts of our body and they all have a different role to play to create whatever type of movement that we're, that we're trying to create. So for example, let's break down the squat. When we look at the squat, we can say your feet. Ideally, your feet should be very stable. I like to look at the foot like a tripod. So you have the base of your heel, the base of your first toe, the base of your fifth toe. All three of those areas should have even pressure during the entire execution of the squat. So let's say a common issue is people will have excessive pronation. So that foot leaves its natural arch shape and it rolls over. Well, now all of a sudden that tripod has flipped down its side. You have excessive pressure on the heel in the base of the first toe. So you've lost stability in the foot. Directly above the foot is the ankle joint. Now the ankle joint needs to be extremely mobile in order for us to get down into a deep squat. If the tibia bone, your shin, can't move forward or translate forward over your foot, your talus bone specifically, you're not going to be able to descend very deep into a squat. Your hips can't descend or else something up the chain is going to compensate. So what we'll see is that people who lack ankle mobility often have compensations in movement during the squat. A couple things could happen. If we look up the chain, 
the knees could collapse inwards. The hips may not be able to descend very far, so the chest then collapses. So my, I may have a problem all the way up at the chest with that person. Every time they squat, their chest is collapsing forward. And as a coach, I'm yelling, chest up, chest up. Well, that's not going to do them any good <laughs> if they have a movement restriction because of ankle mobility. You can't just cue your way through a, through a mobility restriction. So we have to understand how something distally can affect something all the way up the body proximally. But then also it can affect the feet because we talked about how the foot needs to remain stable. You want to maintain that tripod foot the entire squat. Well, if you have a restriction in ankle mobility, you're starting to squat down. Your knees are starting to move forward over your toes. If you butt up against that restriction, the body's going to try to compensate. The knees may wobble in. All of a sudden, that foot's going to roll right over. So the body will lose stability in the presence of a mobility restriction often when you're trying to push your body through those deep positions. So we have to be able to understand and screen the body to discover what is the real restriction. Where's the problem really lying? We can't just assume we have to assess. That's something that I heard Eric Cressy say one time. We can't assume we have to assess. So we also have, if we go up, so we had foot stability, we had ankle mobility, knees, they need to remain stable. Doesn't take a genius to know, I don't want my knees to cave in when I squat. Sure, you can get by with it for a while. A number of athletes do. A number of great athletes have a lot of knee valgus. Long term, that will not play out well for their knees. It's simple biomechanics. If you look at the knee in the way in which the knee joint operates, when it's loaded and then moved like that, there's a lot of excessive forces placed on small structures of that joint, yeah. and eventually it wears out. That's why we have those chronic injuries. They're not same day injuries in the weight room. You're not going to tear your ACL on a squat. You will develop nagging knee pain that eventually turns into arthritis, that eventually turns into a total knee replacement one day. So understanding the small complexities allows us to really make the changes that we need to change. So all the way up, we have the hip. It needs to be mobile. The hip's a little weird because it needs to be stable as well. And on up the body, you basically have these uh, recurring patterns of stable platforms, mobile joints, stable platforms, mobile joints, all the way up the body. And by understanding that, just sort of taking a step back, we stop looking at the body through a microscope. I'm not looking at your tibialis anterior. I'm looking at your foot, the ankle, the knee, the hip, the low back, the pelvis, and I'm understanding how all of those play a part in fixing the movement issue. Now, yes, understanding how certain muscles allow us to change movement and to manipulate stability is extremely important. That's why, you know, school for a physiotherapist, you know, often takes years and years and years. I mean, I went to college for seven years and I'm still learning every single day. <laughs> yeah. so there's still a lot that we need to understand yeah. as far as the looking at the body through a microscope, but that's often not the main issue many people have. Most practitioners don't have that issue. They're very good at that. They can tell you every single, you know, muscle in the body, it's insertion, it's origin, it's nerve innervation. That doesn't take a genius to memorize that kind of stuff. It takes a great practitioner to take a step back and view the body and how it's moving and understand how that matters as far as how someone has developed an injury and what we need to do to get them out of injury. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's, again, it's, I think it's probably a reason we've seen such a huge boom in kind of this uh, prehabilitational e education that we're seeing more and more now. Obviously, like great pages like like yourself that are putting out there that are really kind of trying to pummel home this education. It's something that I'm huge with my clients. Frustratingly mm. enough, <laughs> we still see it on a mass basis every single day and almost <laughs> makes you want to pull your hair out because you're like, there's so much stuff out there. But I'm really interested as to your thoughts on do we need to be taking more time and really educating the, the younger population of young lifters coming through about the importance of, you know, all of this stability, the structure, the injury prevention. So we then give these guys a chance to never be in a position of these old time lifters where it's like, you know, I'll fucking blown out both knees <laughs> hip replacement my back's yeah. fused like how much 
I get that. It's, I think it's really fucking tough because, you know, as much as you want to be able to tell these young kids stuff, and I'm like, fuck, I remember when I was like 14, 15, it's like my coach yeah. telling me things. I'm like, yeah, what do you know, old man? It's like, okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> There's only so much you can hammer into these kids. But like, do you, do you think that we need to be pushing more towards that? Or is it kind of like, okay, we're just going to have to let them be and get on with that phase of training? And potentially we just need to to kind of be pushing this pre-ab stuff because we're just going to have to get over the fact that these guys are always going to kind of get run through the mill and get injured in their own time because they're going to be too stubborn to listen to anyone else. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that's a great question. I think it sort of points to the idea of what Squat University is all about is education. But let me talk to you in a way that you understand and you can really take it to heart. And that's a big reason why I like I love to do so many different collaborations with bigger name athletes is because it allows um, younger lifters to understand what I'm getting at and it makes them listen for a second. And I understand that I'm not going to reach everyone for sure. There's many lifters out there probably like, ah, knee wobble, it's not a big issue. I don't care what this guy says. It's not going to happen to me. That's a very, right? That's a very uh, normal response that you'll see from a lot of young lifters. But if I can take an athlete and explain, be like, hey, this is what so-and-so elite athlete was going through. Um, and here's what we found, and here's what we did. And now this elite athlete is, is taking this approach to get out of pain and to get back to performing well. All of a sudden, you're going to get that 16-year-old lifter, and it's gonna, he's going to think a little bit differently about how he's approaching his own training. He's going to understand, hey, so I mean, think about it like this. If I was a young basketball player in the 90s and I heard Michael Jordan is doing these exercises to warm up before he went out on, on the practice court, hell, I would have been doing those every single day. Yeah. Because Michael Jordan does them. So that's why it's so great. Like, for example, um, I have been able to work with uh, Martins, Lisi's, um, the past couple months. And the thing that I love about Martins is he's very, very uh, great at communicating to all the people that follow him why he's doing everything. He's not just doing the exercises that I give him just because some physical therapist gave it to him to do. He understands the why behind him. And he's telling patients, he's like, or telling patients, he's telling the people that follow him, like, hey, I'm doing this hip airplane because I had an imbalance in my hips and it was causing me to shift during my squat. And that was hurting my knee and my hamstring. So now when I'm doing this, I'm loosening up my hips. I'm My hips, I'm allowing myself to have a more balanced approach to squatting and i feel awesome i do these every single day i think he just released two youtube videos recently about sort of chronicling this the stuff that we're going through to fix his injuries yeah. and he's like these are the things that i'm doing every day here's why i'm doing it so some young athlete who's looking up to him is going to be like wow that's a game changer you're the strongest man in the world you can squat you know this huge amount of weight and you're taking time out of your day to do these little things to fix your body and to prepare your body for lifting, maybe I need to rethink the way in which I'm going about my training. So that's why I love being able to do these type of collaborations is because I know that it's going to help so many other people. And I know Martins is extremely happy that he's also going to be able to help a ton of young athletes, young and old that are going through similar things. And they don't have to take that no pain, no gain mindset that we had so many years ago. I hope that dies. There's a time and a place to push our body, but as a strength athlete, I don't need to tell you to get ready for this big lift. <laughs> I should, I shouldn't have to tell you. Yeah. If so, you shouldn't be a strength athlete. Yeah, you shouldn't be here. Exactly. If there's 500 pounds on the bar and you're about to try to hit a 90% lift, you're gonna get ready. I don't need to be smacking your back or yeah, yelling yeah. at you. You should be. Some G-Lab. athletes need that. You know, some coaches know when that's appropriate, but most athletes they know how to psych themselves up for that. It's the role of the physical therapist and the coach to say, hey, here's when we take a step back. This is what we need to do so that you can continue hitting those big weights in the future. Because I don't care whether or not you hit that PR today. I want you to continue hitting that PR for years to come. And the issue with a lot of injuries is that it allows us many times to hit that PR once and then it flares out. I mean, how many athletes do we know that make a big scene in a national meet or an international meet and then that's it they do it once we never hear from them again <laughs> oh they they hurt their back they hurt their knee they had surgery they never made it back 
because the way in which often that they're approaching their training allowed them to be an amazing athlete but it didn't have the foundational support of proper movement preparation beforehand to allow their extremely strong body to function as it was designed to. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting. I've spoken to a lot of uh, kind of strongman competitors and powerlifters and stuff and kind of, they all kind of say the same thing that like, it doesn't take you long to get strong and like you can get fucking strong in a really short space of time if you want to. Mm-hmm. But, and there is a big but. You then have the issue of longevity. When you are packing on the pounds and you are shifting weight that fast and you are progressing that fast, your body does not have time to acclimatize to those jumps. Therefore, yep. long term, there is going to be huge imbalances. And it's exactly like you said there. We see these guys burst onto the scene and mm-hmm. then they hit these titles, the, they hit, hit these new national records, and then they just fizzle and die out. And it's because they haven't they haven't respected their body enough to take it through the necessary steps. And I think that's mm-hmm. that's something that I really, really want to touch on because, again, as someone that's trained in a gym, I've been around a lot of kind of gen pop people, and it is that mentality of just like, I just want to keep on getting strong, I just want to keep on getting strong, I just want to keep on getting strong. It's like, okay, well you're benching like crap you're telling me you've got <laughs> shoulder pain you're telling me you've got tendonitis you're, you're benching with a belt on just because it gives you like 10 extra kilos like maybe we need to assess a couple <laughs> of things here do you know what i mean <laughs> yeah and i think the big thing with that is a lot of people for so long have been told that aches and pains are a part of the strength game <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, yeah. Back, that back pain is normal for a power lifter that elbow pain or knee pain is normal for a weightlifter, you know, is, oh, we throw some icy hot on it. Oh, that's, <laughs> why I, I, that's why I got knee wraps, you know, get, get some, get some knee wraps. They'll be good for you. You know, we're, we're going about it the wrong way. We're not understanding that there's a movement issue likely that is the underlying why behind what you're feeling. And it's okay to have to take a step back. You're not going to lose all your gains. People have been working their butt off for years and years. It's not going to go away in a couple of weeks by trying to take a step back and, re- and adjust your movement issues. Um, so that's a big fear that a lot of people have. And I totally understand. I mean, there's times where, you know, I've had that back pain that's taken me out in the middle of an important week for me in training. And all of a sudden I'm like, damn it, I just spent all these weeks like, pushing and pushing and pushing like I was going to have an amazing week this week yeah. and it's not going to be there. And then you get frustrated and you know, it's, I understand that, but we need to, to tell people, we need to educate others that it's more important to set that foundation of proper movement first and then lift the big weight. And when we go about it that way, we build the base of our pyramid. I think it was Louis Simmons that, that said uh, pyramid can only be as tall as it is wide. Why did he say this? Because your that movement foundation, the the preparatory phases of moving well and building the stability, uh, allows you then to have a very very tall pyramid, which is going to be performance, skill, everything like that that we want to focus on so much. Yeah. But often the way in which athletes view their bodies, if you were to think about taking that pyramid and flip it up, <laughs> yeah, down, I was about to it, say. All they're caring about is that performance and that skill. Yeah, they just skip out that first fucking level. They're like, ah, oh, man. It's like, exactly. like the manual to like the Ikea furniture or whatever. Just that like typical, but like, ah, oh, fuck it, I'll be all right. And it's like half an hour later. Exactly. You're like, where's peace, J8? And you're like, god damn it. <laughs> exactly. I, an analogy I like to use a lot is building a house uh, on a rocky foundation. And if you think about it, more often than not, athletes of today are so consumed with building that fancy house, adding more levels to their home, furnishing it with the biggest TV, the nice couches, everything. But their house has a foundation of sand. (laughs) So sure, you can build it quickly and it's going to look great. But if it's built on sand, what happens the next time a storm blows through? That house is going to topple over. So when it comes to our bodies, we can understand that the way in which we move, the ability to sit into a deep squat. If there's a power lifter out there, and the thing I hate is hearing, oh, I can't squat deep unless a barbell's on my back. That's not a good thing. Yeah. If, you, if you can't squat deep without weight on your back, it means you have a problem in moving. 
Yeah, but you're you also need, like, bro, I call bullshit because you go to the toilet. So if you can sit on the toilet seat, then you've got to have something here. Like, you're not pulling yourself yeah. up and down off of a pulley system. So you, you've got to have some kind of functionality there. Exactly. Now, I don't need, uh, you know, a super heavyweight power lifter to be able to do the splits. But they <laughs> need to have a sufficient amount of mobility to be able to perform a basic bodyweight squat to a deep position without weight on their back. Because if you need that weight, it's showing, it's trying to cover up a problem that you probably have in stability and mobility that is hindering future performance potentially and setting you up for injury. And by uncovering what that is and then fixing it, it's going to allow you to move better. It's going to decrease that risk of injury and it's going to set you up for hitting those potential improvements in strength and power and allow you to do so for a longer time. And that's really what it all comes down to. Yeah, and I, uh, I, I always say this to my clients, and it's something that I push out to a lot of people, is that you have to earn the right to put weight on the bar. You don't just walk into the gym and you put weight on the bar and you go. It's like, no, 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 no. The amount of time I've kind of, you know, a client's gone through their first set of warm-up squats, I haven't said anything, they've racked it, they've gone to grab a plate, and I'm like, whoa, whoa, what are you doing? Yeah, they look like shit. We've got, we've got to sort these squats out before we start getting some weight on the bar because you know it's that whole thing again. It's the whole set in the foundation that carry, carries across to this. Well, your foundation is your warm up. Well, if you're warming up poorly, you're not reinforcing that movement pattern correctly. You are not reinforcing the activation of the supportive structures of the body that, that you need. So, what the fuck mm -hmm. do you think is going to happen when you've got 100 kilos on your back? You think those supportive structures are just going to suddenly turn on? No! Yeah. That's why we reinforce it now. Exactly. I remember I made a post on Instagram a couple of weeks ago, maybe a couple months ago, and it said, if you can't perform a great looking body weight squat, no weight on your back, to full depth, you have not earned the right to squat with a barbell on your back. And there were a number of people that commented, and they're like, this is ridiculous. <laughs> I squat better with a weight on my back, or I don't need to perform. A body weight movement doesn't mean anything. And it's, it's that same idea that I'm trying to challenge people to understand is that we need to move well first before we move big weight. Because if you don't and you say, ah, that's ridiculous, I can, I can teach one, someone how to squat with weight, that's completely fine. Well, then you're saying I'm okay continuing to build my house up and continue to put uh, you know, some fancy blinds and some shutters <laughs> up, but there's a big old base of foundation that's all sand. And I'm not going to address that. I'll get to it one day. We'll be okay with it. You know, we cannot add strength on top of dysfunctional movement and think it's going to be okay in the end. And again, it's this short-term approach to training and thinking, because I'm not injured now, I will never be injured <laughs> again. You know, it's this short-term approach that we, that's the pro that's where we get into, into problems uh, with training and not taking that long-term approach and understanding that what you do now not only set you up to move better as far as your current workout program this year, this month, you know, but it sets you up for a lifetime of better movement. And that's a skill that I think a lot of people would benefit from. You know, it's the ability to grab your grandkid and pick him up when you're 65. It's the ability to walk up and down the stairs when you're 75. You know, so many things that we take for granted now because we're young we don't realize how important moving well is and moving big weight is because if you do it poorly, it's going to affect those things later in life. Yeah, and I think it's really interesting, isn't it? Because it's this whole thing of like, you know, you're talking about kind of weightlifting and these movement patterns to reinforce these structures to give you the longevity and to be able to do these things in later life. Whereas the, there's this very old school stereotypical like thought process of like, you fucking lift weights, you get big, and then you hit like 40, and your hips are fucked, and your back's <laughs> fucked, and you're like, no, 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 yeah. that's literally the complete opposite of what we're trying to go for here. Yeah, the amount of the amount of old school power lifters I've met that are like, ah, uh, you know, my, my got two total hips, got a new knee, new shoulder, but man, I used to squat 700, <laughs> like, and I'm like, awesome, you can't do that now. You can't come close to that now. You, it's hurting you to bend over to pick up a chair. Yeah, you're going to herniate you know? a disc to do like a barbell deadlift. 
Exactly. I mean, and, and here's the deal. Is a lot of people will take that idea, that sentiment, and they'll say that I'm telling you that I don't care how much you lift or I'm not trying to push you to PRs. Quite the opposite. I'm telling you what I'm trying to allow you to do by moving better is going to allow you to not only hit that PR, but hit it even more than you thought you were capable of. You think 700 pounds is cool? What about 750 with better movement? And you're not going to hurt afterwards. You're not going to get to the point where it's a 700-pound squat, and then uh, that left uh, hip starts bugging you. I'm going to have to take a couple weeks off. I'm working with a weightlifter right now that was very elite, and every couple months when he competed, he would be in so much pain afterwards that he would need to take a couple months off and then recover and then back on the training program Uh and lift, lift, lift big meat do well and then all right i gotta take a little bit off after that it shouldn't have to be like that if we're moving well and i think now that we're changing things up in his program and how he's moving he's gonna notice he's gonna get up those heavy weights he's gonna have that big meat he's gonna go huh i still feel pretty good i may have to only take like a purposeful deload to let my buddy recover but it's for recovery it's not for injury management because we're actually going about things the right way this time. Yeah, and it's that whole thing of, you know, every single time that you get these little ni- like niggles and injuries is it's just like it's another speed bump in the road. And I think that's the issue is that a lot of people do see it like that, but what a lot of people don't see is they don't see the fucking length of that road and how many speed bumps there are. And actually, if we take out the speed bumps, then the chances are the suspension in your car is probably going to run a lot better and your car's, <laughs> your car's gonna last you a lot longer everything's gonna feel better you're not gonna be thrown all over the place inside the cab like everything's yeah. gonna feel better so why don't we look at trying to purposefully take some of those speed bumps out by taking a step back and going okay well let's actually look at what we need to work on to be functional and actually move yes. correctly <laughs> And that's, that's a great analogy because here's the thing. Um, there's not a single athlete out there who's lifted for a number of years that is never experiencing some ache or pain during the course of a training year. There's always something that's going to flare up, a little bit of knee, a little bit of hip, a little bit of elbow. There's always yeah. something that we're managing. But the idea is that if we can manage it versus cover it up, then the effects of it don't really bleed into our training performance. And then they don't become things that are chronic in nature. I shouldn't hear you say, yeah, I've been training and my left knee has been giving me, uh, you know, problems for last, you know, year or two, year or two. That's way (laughs) too long. You know, that's, that's not a problem then. That's a serious issue you need to deal with. Like you mentioned a speed bump. If there's days that you wake up and you're like, ah, my left knee's a little achy. You know, we need to address it that day. We need to address it that week <laughs> okay, and understand. Yeah. yeah, we need to go, why is it there? And what can I do? And really, that's all the information that I put out there with Squat University is saying, hey, your knee's hurting. What's going on? Try these tests. What did you find? Oh, you found that it's a little bit of an ankle imbalance, right versus left side. Let's address that. Did it get better? Awesome. Now you know that your knee pain is likely because of that imbalance. And in fixing this and addressing it, your pain is going to decrease and you're going to get back to performing well. And you didn't have to take, you know, a number of weeks off because all you did was lift, 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 and then break. Because that's the mentality of so many strength athletes is we push, push, push until we break, then we rebuild, and then we do it again. When in reality, it should be lift, lift, manage, lift, lift, manage, because those things come up. Whenever you're pushing your body to the max day in and day out as a strength athlete, the body sometimes pushes back. And if we can better manage when it does, that's the smooth, perfect intersection that we're looking for on the road of training, if you will. Yeah, 100%. I think I think that's probably one one of the biggest things. I think, you know, really interesting that you talk about working with Martins there, especially for, you know, these these sports that are so, that have so many different dynamics to them, is that it is so, so, so important to keep on top of those small little things and making sure that the functionality is always there throughout all of these different patterns and you know yes that might be a little bit of a shoulder niggle today but after that press medley that you do you know 
how much more damage are you putting on top of that? You know, how many more mm-hmm. speed bumps are you putting in down the road that you don't, don't then address or you walk into a session you're like, oh man, this is really tight, but then you don't spend any time mobilizing or activating or doing any, you know, self manufacture release. It's like, okay, well, we have the option here. <laughs> so let's, let's yeah. maybe, maybe start taking them. And I think it's, again, this brings, brings us on to kind of getting into uh getting into activity and i've heard you talk about kind of uh, a few different bits and pieces but i'm interested to kind of throw different things at you so in terms of like coming into a session warming up you know there are various different principles i know you're a big fan of the the mcgill big three which i'm a huge Mm -hmm. proponent of absolutely fantastic for activating you know your core but you know to an extent i feel like for a lot of things we can kind of get to the same destination by various different roads you know whether it is Mm -hmm. You know, doing uh, like your wedding warm ups, whether it's doing your McGill Big Three, whether it's doing your five to ten minutes of medium to, to high intensity cardio, followed by some stretching and activation. What do you think people need to be doing coming into the session to make sure that they are ready? The biggest thing people need to understand is that no two people's warm up should look the same because our goal yes. with the warm up is to prepare our body to perform as best as possible with whatever we're trying to do that day. If you have a squat session, a snatch, um, whatever you're trying to lift, your warm up then needs to reflect what your body needs to prepare yourself to move as best as possible. What can be the most optimal way of moving and getting you there? So everyone's going to be looking a little bit differently. The big thing, we need a, a little bit of a warm up as far as our cardiovascular uh, you know, system goes. Ride a bike for a little bit, do a little jog. Get your blood pumping. I want to see you break a sweat a little bit. Um, On top of that, you need to understand what your individual deficits are in movement. So if you have a squat session that day, what does your body need? Do you have limited ankle mobility or an imbalance? You should have already tested that. You should know, hey, I'm spending a little bit of time on my ankle mobility. Um, I need to spend a little bit of time on my right hip. So you're going to address those things, understanding what the end goal is. I need to be able to move well in the squat. So you're going to address those things, and this should not take more than 5, 10 minutes, and then you're going to get under the barbell. Again, an open barbell. So many people, they're like, oh, I come in the gym. I do a little something. I throw you know, 60 kilos on the bar. No, that's the open barbell. Oh, yeah. And you're going to do a number of repetitions to help prime your body in that movement, uh, whatever movement pattern you're doing, prime that technique, prime your brain body's connection to move well, and then slowly add on weight. So you sort of have this uh, this sequence of get my body warmed up, break a little bit of a sweat, whatever you're doing, um, and then prime my body for whatever you need that day to perform as well as possible. Now, the way in which I usually break things down is, is if you were to go into a fancy restaurant and they hand you a menu, the last thing you're going to do is say, I want all of those, right? <laughs> you get... Uh, an appetizer, you get an entree, you get a dessert. So a simple way to understand is that uh, we're going to pick a few things that your body needs to help address your individual deficits. So that may be a little bit of foam rolling, that may be a little bit of joint mobility work, but most people have some mobility and some stability problems or things that they could prime to help them move better. Again, that's our end goal. Um, so you have to sort of pick and choose and see what works best for you. Everyone's going to look a little, be a little bit different, but in the end, our our warm up will also change. My warm up today does not look like my warm up last year, because my body has adapted and has changed a little bit as far as what it needs to be able to perform as well as possible. There's some things that are consistent. I love doing the McGill Big Three because no matter what type of training I'm doing, I am probably wanting to prime core stability. That's a, a big one for almost every single power lift. Um, for example, uh, being able to get into a very deep squat position is key for a snatch or a clean injury. So I'll do some hip and ankle mobility. Sitting down in a deep goblet squat is great for me. That's something that I like to do. But if I get an athlete in that's just uh, extremely mobile, I'm not going to have them do that. So again, it all comes down to finding what that individual needs to sort of prime and hit those different levels so that they can then move as optimally as possible and then get under the barbell. So the one piece of advice I'd say to any athlete, A, 
10 to 15 minutes, something that's going to prime your body. Do not just slap weight on the bar. Even the best athletes don't go in and just throw it on the bar. Take the barbell for a couple reps without any weight and then slowly add some weight. Yeah. Yeah, a hundred percent. I think you brought up a fantastic point there, which I, you know, I haven't really spoken about, but this whole concept of you have to adapt and review your warm ups to reflect your progression as, you know, an athlete or a gym goer because you will obviously develop different strengths over time if you are training correctly yeah. and you know that, you know, maybe your hamstrings are weak and you develop your hamstrings, okay, well, your warm up isn't probably going to be focused so much on trying to get your hamstrings to switch on. So why the fuck are you still warming up that way? Okay, the, hamstrings, <laughs> exactly. the hamstrings are warm, but currently your quads are dead or your glutes aren't firing for shit. So we yeah. need to then change the focus from there to then build this thing up. And I think that's a that's a really fascinating point. That it's again, it's like this ever changing dynamic that we constantly have to keep on reassessing and reaffirming. Okay, what is right for my body now? what is right for my body now and what is right for my body now. And every single one of those points, potentially, you know, from a macro standpoint, could look completely freaking different because the demands on your yeah. body are different, you know, depending on exactly. the season or the lifts or whatever. And that's where I think uh, something practically people can take away is it's always assess, execute, reassess. So, for example, if you're getting ready to squat, sit into a deep squat without shoes on, toes relatively straightforward, barbell on your back sit into a really deep squat what does it look like what does it feel like is it easy to get into probably not then you probably have some mobility work to do here's some breakout screens to do the five inch wall test there's a number of different screens that's why a lot of the content that i share with squat university is like different tests yeah it's brilliant tests, things like that so that people can understand how to analyze their own body and figure out what's going on you know that's the thing is we're always assessing and reassessing if you're doing a snatch that day you should be able to sit down body weight uh grabbing the barbell no shoes on no olympic weightlifting shoes on and you should be able to hit a perfect overhead squat and just sit in the bottom and if you can't why what's going on do you have an overhead uh, restriction mobility wise do you have maybe that left elbow is a little achy well let's screen that left elbow let's screen the right shoulder or the left shoulder and sort of figure out what's going on and that's going to change your warm-up for that day so we have to be able to have an assessment a reassessment and understand what are we doing and are we affecting our end goal in movement yeah yeah a hundred percent a hundred percent i love that absolutely love that now i uh j just wrapping things up i i end the podcast the same way i'm very very interested to to hear what you say so for a second yeah. I, I want you to imagine that you are stepping into a time machine okay you're stepping into a time machine you get to go back to visit your younger self, let's say like 10, 11, 12 years of age. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you've got your whole life ahead of you, all of your studies, uh, all of the, the things that you've had to go through in your personal life, in your business, online. You get to spend a few minutes with your younger self and you get to impart a mantra, a, a way to live your life, a, a wisdom, knowledge, information that you can give to your younger self to help your younger self get through all that shit, get through all the problems, mm -hmm and get to where you are today. What do you say? What do you give to yourself? I'm interested to hear. Man, that's a tough one. I would say, uh, you know, the big thing, when I, when I was a kid, I, I didn't really worry about a lot of stuff. I was very optimistic in things. So I would just say just, you know, I, I think things happen in life for a reason, and I think good things and bad things happen in life for a reason. So really, I probably wouldn't have changed anything. I just would have been like, keep on going through life and, and, and stick to your beliefs and stay positive about things. Because, you know, things in life, I think that look bad at a point, I think shape us to who we are going to be in the future. I remember growing up, baseball was my biggest sport. I loved baseball. I wanted to play right field for the Detroit Tigers. That was my big thing. And uh, as, as much as I loved the sport, uh, my body was not an athletic uh, baseball player. You know, I just, the skill wasn't yeah. there. Um, and I tried and tried. I would take out, you know, I had a batting cage that I would put up in my, in my parents' garage and I would just take cuts and cuts out all night long, try to get my, get my swing down. I'd read books on how to hit 300, you know, I would do as much as I could, you know, staying after school and doing drills by myself to try to become a better baseball player. And in the end, you know, I didn't do very well in baseball. 
I uh, tried out for my college team, ended up hurting my elbow in tryouts. <sighs> but then that next week, I found the Olympic weightlifting team at Truman State University. <laughs> you know, so it's like sometimes things that yeah. um, we try so hard. I, I think the big thing is just keeping, you know, an optimistic viewpoint and understanding yes. that if you keep working hard at whatever aspect that you're that you're doing and you truly have passion for things, good things are going to happen in the end. Yes, I love that. I love that. I love that. What a perfect way to end, man. It has been an absolute pleasure having you on. I can sit here and talk to you all night long, but I know you're a busy man. So thank you so much for coming on board and doing this, man. I really, really appreciate you coming by. Hey, I, I appreciate having me on, man. It was a lot of fun.